All the people assembled with a unified purpose. At the square just inside the water gate, they asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. So on October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of law before the assembly, which included the men and the women and all the children old enough to understand. He faced the square just inside the water gate from the early morning until noon and read out loud to everyone who could understand. All the people listened closely to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. To his right, right stood Methathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hikiah, and Messiah. Messiah. To his left stood Padiah, Mashiel, uh, Malkiah, Hashum, Hashbandana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezraite stood on the platform in full view of all the people. When they, when they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. When Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, the people all chanted, Amen, Amen. See, Amen. And they lifted their hands. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, uh, the Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jaim, uh, Achab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah, then instructed the people in the law while everyone remained in their places. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping the people to understand each passage. Then, Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, don't mourn or weep on a such a day as this, for this is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And Nehemiah continued, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks. And share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the Levites too quieted the people, telling them, hush, don't weep. For this is a sacred day. So the people went away to drink and eat and drink at a festive meal, to share gifts of food and to celebrate with great joy because they had heard God's words and understood them. Now to our focus scriptures. On October 9th, the next day, the family leaders and all the people together with the priests and Levites met with Ezra the scribe to go over the law in greater detail. They studied the law and they discovered that the law had commanded through Moses that the Israelites should live in shelters during the festival to be held that month. He had said that the proclamation should be made throughout their towns and in Jerusalem, telling the people to go to the hills and get branches from olive, wild olive, myr myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees. They were to use these branches to make shelters in which they would live during the festival as prescribed in the law. So the people went out and cut branches and used them to build shelters on the roofs of their houses and in their courts, in the courtyards of God's temple or in the square just inside the water gate and the Ephraim gate. So everyone who had returned from captivity lived in these shelters during the festival and they were all filled with great joy. The Israelites had not celebrated like this since the days of Joshua, son of Nun. Ezra read the book of the law of God on each of the seven days of the festival. Then on the eighth day, they held a solemn assembly as was required by law. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Amen. 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 Four masked men came in with assault rifles screaming at the preacher and members during the worship service. They said anyone who would deny their faith could leave safely, but the pastor had to stay and face the outcome. Silence filled the church, and finally, one after another, people began to rise from their seats and move to the exit. 
The church was now less than half full. The gunman checked one last time to see if anybody wanted to leave. Some of the people were sobbing, some were praying, some were looking steadfast at the cross with eyes filled with tears. They were ready for what was to come. The men slowly lowered their rifles. The leader who gave the instructor gave one last command. Preach on, preacher. Here are your real members. The men left quickly without anyone knowing who they were. The stunned people looked at each other and all the empty seats. Commitment. What does it look like? Amen. Commitment. What does it look like? This story, while, while, while difficult for us to hear somewhat because we are so inundated by violence everywhere, but it let us know that when the rubber meets the road, it may not be gunmen, it may be struggle, it may be a problem, it may be something that needs to get, uh, get, get resolved. What happens to our commitment when we're up against it? There are those who are in our younger group who, uh, who love things like PlayStation and, 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 and all the others. Y'all name some for me. Come on, I can hear you. Uh -huh. Nintendo Switch. Yeah, I heard that switch twice. That must be the, the greatest <laughs> thing out now, right? The Xbox. But here's what I know about y'all. When you start playing it, you can play it all day long. Amen. Amen. You can play it hours and hours of concentrated playtime and go to sleep with the with the, the joystick in your hand and wake up and start all over again. I, I want you to know, young people, you know something about commitment. Yeah. All right. But they're not alone. Some of us find ourselves on social media from sun up to sundown. We don't know anything happening for real in the world if Facebook doesn't say it's so. Amen? We know something about commitment. There's a story that I just heard, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to do it the short version of it. But, but, but this family knew something about commitment, too. This is a story that was on Channel 8 this morning about a, a brother and a sister who had been searching for each other for seven years. For seven years they had been looking for this long lost sibling. And here's the irony of it. They, the mother was taking a child to treatments at a doctor's office that was passing the brother's studio every single time didn't know who each other was, didn't know that they were related. The DNA was taken, and, and during the course of the treatments, that they were kept coming back and kept going back to that same place, uh, to that same doctor's office, passing that studio every day. On the day of the last treatment, they got the news that that person who was the brother, was in that studio right at that place where they were getting the treatments, and they were brought together. They were brought together not because of some DNA test. They were brought together because they had commitment to finding one another. Amen. Today, our text comes from one of the three related historical books. Nehemiah is sandwiched in the middle between Ezra and Esther. Ezra is, is the book of restoration. I know we just heard his name. I'm coming back to him. But, but Ezra is a book of restoration. Esther is the book of preservation. And in between, Nehemiah is the book of reconstruction. See, once they had the wall built, it was necessary for them to remember who they were. Yes, yes, yes. For those of you who don't know this, I, I, let me give you the, the recap right quick. Uh, Israel had been in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. The people who were alive 
when they got in, they went into captivity, most of them had now passed away, but there was a remnant that was still left. Folks that was about you all's age that could hold on and was older than 70, they were there when they returned back to Israel. So what ended up happening is Nehemiah heard about the, 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 the shambles of the of the temple in Jerusalem. He traveled back to start getting some folks to build up this wall, to build the wall so that they could rebuild the temple. Nehemiah was able to do that, but after they had built the temple, guess what? They didn't know what to do with it. Because far too many of them had never been in their own temple. They had been in Babylon. Yes. And so the remnant that knew uh, were looking to the one who was able to teach them, and that was Ezra. So they had to remember because those who had been in captivity, that remnant, had to model the traditions so the young who were in Bab who were Babylon influenced. So it wasn't just that they were in Babylon, but that's all they knew. And if Babylon's all you know, we. It, you can't know, you can't do what you don't know. And we keep expecting folks to run in church and be all the church folk are. Amen. But they don't know the language. They don't know the customs. They don't know what it is they're supposed to do. So when they come and they come to be a part of, when they as young people may have not been in church, when they get here, we can't make there to teach. They would teach. These, these young people, these, these young people that came from Babylon were of mixed heritage because they were told while they were in Babylon to do what? You Bible scholars know to, to, to get married and to have children, to do all of those things. And they did. So that the nation could stay alive, but now the nation is what? Mixed. But they didn't beat the young for not knowing. They didn't beat them up. They didn't say, you ought to know. You should have kept the precepts. They taught. They taught them by precept and example. It's not enough to tell. We got to show it. So Ezra is the sage. Ezra knows the history. Ezra, Ezra knows the, the book. Ezra knows the law. And Ezra knows the commands of God that God gave to the ancestors. For those of us who are a part of or who, who, who are, are knowledgeable about the diaspora, Ezra is the griot. Ezra's the griot of these people. He, he remembers the custom. He re remembers the people. He remembers the ancestors. He remembers the stories. I'm saying all that because, listen, if we don't tell the stories, right. come on, come on. Texas Education Association can't help us. Because they've decided that what our history is is, 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 is able to be diluted. And, and, and to be taken away because it's uncomfortable yeah. for some. Yeah. But we've got to have some Ezra's in our lives. Yeah. And those who do not know have to be able to sit at their feet and learn who you are and who your folk were and who your ancestors were and what they went through and what they survived and to not get bored with it because the resilience that was in them is in you, but you don't know it. Because nobody's told you. And nobody's shown you. Amen? Amen. So church, we got to step up. One place, this has always been the place. Uh, this, wasn't on, on, this ain't on the paper. Let me say this. <laughs> this has always been the place. Where what needed to be said could be said. Yeah. And no one could come in the doors and tell us not to say it. Amen. 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 So we can't be so assimilated that we don't remember that we got a, a, a message to tell. I bet you when you walked in the synagogue today, they're telling the history. 
So we cannot throw our history away because we want to go along to get along. So let, let me let me get back to the story. So so what 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 Ezra does is he tells the story. He talks about the law to the masses, you know, to to, to the whole church. Amen? Amen. But then on the following day, he takes a small group, small group of leaders. Herein lies a wonderful model for leadership. And, and, and for discipleship. But we'll talk about that some more as we go forward. That he took those who were knowledgeable, who understood, but were also the leaders, and taught them the specific details. See, everybody in the masses are not ready for the real truth. Sometimes the leaders have to be taught the real truth so that it can be disseminated to those who are ready to hear it when they're ready to hear it. That's why leadership's important in the church. Yeah. So he took that small group, the Levites, the priests, those who could understand what was necessary for them to go forward, what they needed to do, what they needed to go back to, what they needed to understand about the commands of God. He took them back to that place and they sat at his feet and they learned. They learned because they had a bold commitment to know. It was not a surface learning. It was not an emotional learning. It was an intentional learning. If they knew that when they learned it, it was going to mean that there were some determined lifestyle changes. That they would have to be dedicated with consistency and they would have to be devoted to worship. So we've been through a lot of these bold things that we must do, but today we're talking about bold commitment. And we have to be committed, not on a surface relationship with God, but in the word, in God's ways, and in worship to God. We have to be boldly committed. So here's what they did, and I, and I won't keep you much longer. We're going to get through these three points. The first thing they were was they were committed to comprehend God's word. That's just like I told you. You can read the King James all day long, but if you walk away from it and you have no understanding, you were just decoding words, but you were not having comprehension. See, when you're reading, there's two things that happen. There's decoding and there's comprehension. If you decode all day long, you can say the word, but you won't know what the word means. When we get excited, when children can decode, it's not important unless they can comprehend. So they, they had to be committed to comprehending God's word. I'm, I'm reminded of the New Testament story of uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. For those of you who thought that, that, uh, that Christianity came to Europe before it came to Africa, it did not. Amen. Christianity came to Africa before it came to Europe. Amen. Amen. So, 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 so. The eunuch was sitting there, you all know the story, who know this story, and those who don't, I'm going to tell it right quick. The eunuch was sitting and trying to read the word from the scrolls. Philip walked up to him, Philip was sent to him, it wasn't on Philip's way, Philip had to be inconvenienced to help the Ethiopian eunuch. That, that's a message for us, sometimes we got to be uh, inconvenienced to do God's will, amen. So, so, so he was inconvenienced and he walked up to the eunuch and he said, do you know what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I know unless somebody teaches me? So we, we've got to be committed to comprehend. We've got to be committed. That means we've got to be committed to be in the places where comprehension can come. I, 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 I'm trying to teach and preach, but I can't do it all. So we've got to go to church school. We've got to go to Bible study. We've got to go to those places where we can learn. And here's the other thing. And ask questions. Yes, ma'am. So how do we read? Do we read it topically? Do we read it theologically? Do we read it historically? How do we read this word we call the word of God? And how can we comprehend? I'm reminded that of a young man in the, the last charge I 
wanted to get him a Bible. So at the store, they called me and said, look, we're looking at Bibles in there. There's so many. We don't know which one to get. And so I gave them three particular ones I thought might be helpful for him. Uh, he was he's 12 at the time, uh, 11 at the time, just turned 12. And so he, he, um, he, I asked him to take down, I gave him a passage of scripture, and I said, read it in this one. And then I had him read it in the next one. And I had him read it in the, the following one. I said, so what did the passage say? And he was able to tell me what he read. I said, which one of them spoke to you? Which one of them helped you understand? And he told me which one. It was in, It was New Living, by the way. He said, this one does. And I said, Mother, that's the one to get him. Because it didn't matter whether it was the NIV or, or, the, uh, or, or the King James or the New King James. If he could not comprehend, it was a waste of money because he wasn't going to be committed to reading. And maybe some of you are like him. You got a Bible, but you really don't know where to start. You've been trying to read the King James for 35 years. <laughs> and every now and again, you get around one of those words or two of those words, and you heard me struggle over some of these names. And guess what? We're going to all struggle over names when we don't understand the language completely. Yeah. But we know who the, that there were people. Amen. Amen. So, so, so you might be trying to figure out what Bible do I need? Find it. Yes. Get online. Yes. Find one that has parallel. Go to Bible Gateway. And that is not a shameless plug for them. I do not work for them. But I do know <laughs> that what they have is every translation available for you to find the one that speaks to you. When he purchased, when she purchased that one, he was able to understand and apply the word. And here's what I found out even after my absence. He is more committed to being at church and working with church because he has a Bible that makes sense for his life. Yeah. Mm. Like these Israelites who were thirsty for the word, we got to have an appetite for this word. I don't know how many of you have a Lay's potato chip issue. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But they did not lie when they said no one can eat just one. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have tried like I have to get off sugar completely. You do fine while you're off it, but when you touch one morsel, <laughs> here come the cravings. Amen. <laughs> So we have, to, we have to be what sometimes is a negative in our, in, in our current culture. Our young folks say, tell the people not to look thirsty. But when it comes to the word of God, we need to be looking and acting and being thirsty. So that we have a hungering, a craving, that we're not just reading the scripture, but we're comprehending, we're taking it in, we're absorbing it, we're ingesting. Because until we do, application will not follow. We cannot do what we do not know. We've got to be boldly committed to comprehending God's word. Then we've got to be boldly committed to carrying out God's commandments. A study of scripture always calls for a response to these questions. What do I do with this now? How should my life change? And, and, and to know that we must do something about what we've learned for it to have any significance to our lives. What sense does it make for you to come here every week? What sense does it make for you to go to Bible study every week, come to church school every Sunday, and walk away and not know any more than you knew when you walked in the door? We've got to have some comprehension and then we've got to know how to apply it so that we can carry out what it says. So when they knew better, these new Babylonians, because see the, the older Babylonians were the remnant, they were remembering. They were trying to get back into what they already knew. 
And like some of us, we, we forgot some stuff because we haven't been doing it like we should. But, but we know we know it. Amen? But you got a group of folk who never knew it. And because we weren't living it out, they couldn't learn it from us. You'll get that later. Amen. <laughs> but, but, but these new Babylon, these Babylonian Jews that came back from Babylonia, they got wind of what Ezra was saying and they got woke. Amen. And they got woke about what God wanted them to do. And for those of you who said, I don't understand that terminology, they, they, they woke up. <laughs> they got to see it. They understood. And they got a zeal for doing it. So when they knew better, they did better. They began to follow the old commandments for the festivals of the tabernacle, the festival of the trumpets, the festivals of the booth. They, they had a history. Y'all know we got a history. Amen. And they, they followed the directive. They gathered several different kinds of leaves as material for the huts. See, each of these materials had a different capacity. Each had a different way of adding to the process of the building. Just like each of us has a different assignment, different gifts that together bond to strengthen the body of Christ, these huts were made of diverse material, placed in diverse places, but served with relentless focus on the why. Why? Because God said so. What keeps us committed is knowing our why. For we must remember what God has done. We must remember who we are in him, that we are all different pieces of the master. And that's why we can say you don't know like I know what God has done for me. And while it sounds cliche, we get excited, when it's, but it's real. For when I of Jesus and all that he's done my soul cries out hallelujah and then my life becomes more committed to what God commands we must carry we must be committed to carry out the commandments because there is a purpose in the process far too often we are looking for the end when we start amen somebody uh, but after copy, but so 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 because we do that, we can't always know what God has in store. Because sometimes we we go to the end of the story before we start the story. Amen. If they had known they had were going to be building huts, some of them would have stayed at home. But after comprehending exactly what God expected. After becoming woke on the things that his commandments represented and learning the importance for their lives, hut building became a joy. Amen. What about what God has done, has asked you to do has become a joy? Amen. Our commitment has to be a joy, not an obligation, Amen. not a chore, Amen. not a, oh Lord, we got to do this again. Amen. 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 If that is your commitment, then you got to meet it with Jesus' joy. Yeah. We must find joy in doing God's will. Not because we want to go to heaven or because we don't want God to be mad. We can't be punitive about why we do stuff. That's just like children who do only because they don't want to get a whooping. You know their heart's not in it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. We got to do it because we desire to do his will in response to the depth of his word and our desire to please the Lord. Amen. We must be and stay boldly committed. Then finally, we must stay, we must be committed, boldly committed to a consecrated life. Consecrated. We hear that word, and for many of us, that's another church word. We don't know what it means. We just hear people say it. Amen? Amen. Consecration means that we know that we are set apart for service. It's kind of online with sanctification, that we are moved out of the fray of the world and co consecrated our lives, committed our lives through the consecration of it, the separation from the world 
Amen? To do God's will. Uh, it's, it's the Romans 12 is the best reference, reference that we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our what? Reasonable service. This story of a Christian who asked the minister, what is consecration? And holding out a blank piece of paper, the pastor replies, it's to sign your name at the bottom of this blank sheet and let God fill it in as he will. <laughs> That's consecration. That you're committed to do it no matter what God puts on your plate. That you're committed to be it no matter what God allows to come into your life. That you're committed to do and to be and to live as God would have you before you even know what's going to come your way. Amen. Committed to consecrate ourselves that everything we do is worship. Everything we do is worship. Somebody needs to understand that. Everything we do is worship. Our lifestyles ought to be worship. Because that's what we were created to do. We were created to worship. Our lives, our gifts, our remembrance of God's goodness ought to position us to worship. After they did what he said to, they praised God for the knowledge. But then they also praised God for the understanding. They praised God for the application. And how did they do it? Together. They assembled and consecrated themselves. Do y'all remember when this was the beginning? At the beginning of this, it said the adults, the men, the women, and what? The children who could understand. This was not a separation of the children away from the rest of the believers, away from the rest of the workers. They were intergenerational in their study and in their understanding and in their working together. They assembled and consecrated themselves in assembly. They could say, Lord, we didn't know. But now we do. We didn't remember, but now we've been enlightened. We got this. So we give ourselves away. Church, we got to be boldly committed. If we want to see the Lord move in our lives, we've got to be and stay boldly committed. If we want to be able to claim that I am the head and not the tail, the, I'm the, the lender and not the borrower, we got to be boldly committed. If we want to be able to say, I will have what I speak, if we want to use the buzz terms of declaring and declaring, we got to do it because we're boldly committed. If we want God to manifest himself in our lives, boldly committed if we want to be a church that draws and doesn't push away we must be boldly 
You got a yes!